Peregrine Falcon is, I'm gonna go with the fastest animal in North America. It can dive at speeds of well over 200 miles an hour. They are bird eaters. They're like streamlined jet fighters. Peregrine falcons eat birds, and so they are extremely fast flyers so that they can catch their prey on the wing. They like to live at these power generating facilities because there's a lot of pigeons and starlings here, and oftentimes they're welcomed here because the utility companies like to see pigeons and starlings knocked back a little bit. Their wingspan is three feet or so. Not a real large bird, but they can have a large personality that makes them seem bigger than they actually are. <laughs> If you go back far enough, peregrine falcons were essentially extinct, extinct in Kentucky. And the last known peregrine falcon nest was found in 1939, I believe. And then until the 1990s, they were functionally extinct in Kentucky. The decline was really for a lot of reasons. Habitat loss is always an issue, but we were also still seeing the effects of the insecticide DDT that had been used and caused their eggshells to thin. And for birds that only reproduce one time a year, it's pretty catastrophic if your, your nest fails. In Kentucky, we didn't have a nesting pair much after the uh, 1940s. In the 80s, all the way up until the early 2000s, there was an effort to reintroduce the species to Kentucky called hacking. This is where you would take chicks and raise them in captivity and then release them as sub-adults into the wild, just hoping that they would nest somewhere throughout the state. The first actual nesting pair was in 1997 in Louisville. There was a bridge here that they laid eggs on. And then from there, they kind of just exploded back throughout the state. And that recovery is mostly attributable to the companies that help support these nesting boxes that the birds are using. LG&E was one of the earliest kind of partners with Kentucky Fish and Wildlife to reestablish them in Kentucky. This was a really early nest box. It was installed in 2004, I believe. They moved in shortly after it was installed, and then they laid their first eggs and had a successful clutch in 2006. It's been so interesting to watch over the years. Each nesting season is incredibly different. The falcon that's currently nesting at Mill Creek, based on her markings and her colorings, our employees and the KDFWR avian biologists have tracked her since 2006. An employee affectionately named her Diana after the goddess of the hunt. Since then, she's been Diana all through these years as a mom myself. It is so interesting to see some of the habits and the activities, whether it's protecting the eggs or you know, going out and getting food, watching the chicks sort of compete for her attention. You know, those are just things that for me personally, I relate to um, as a mother myself. back up to help this banding process go smoothly for the chicks. Both the male and the female, especially the female, is going to be really, really protective. So the team that we have here on the roof is essentially bait. We're to serve as a distraction to get the female out of the box. And what that will do is allow the team that has gone up into the stack to insert a really thin barrier between the opening of the box and the inside of the stack, and that way it excludes mom and dad for the short time that the biologists will be in there and banding the chicks. Nicely done. We'll open up the box, we'll pull the chicks out, we put them in a little cardboard box that has cubbies in it, and then that just keeps them from getting too close to each other or hurting themselves accidentally. Oh, you're the cute one, aren't you? We had to come during a certain time window because we have just about five days when the chicks are an appropriate age for us to band them. All right, maybe one male, one female. Yep. Their bone structure is just about full grown at this age, but they're going to grow a lot of muscles and feathers before they learn to fly about two weeks from now. She's on to us now. Yep, I'd say so. Right now, let's see. Right now, Mom is sitting on the, the uh, landing pad and Dad is circling around. Thankfully, the, the biologists work really quickly as make sure they minimize the stress to the adults, but they'll probably take turns switching off on the perch and just keeping an eye on things until they can open it back up. Gloves for getting them out? Uh, I probably would if I were you. They bite pretty hard at this age. We'll pull them out individually. One of us will hold them. The other person will attach leg bands to both legs. We cover their faces just to keep them nice and calm through the process. This one looks big, like it's probably a female. Females are bigger than the males. They have bigger feet, bigger legs. They also have a lower pitched voice. 
Yeah, definitely a female. We put a band on each leg. One of them is the same type of band that you'll see on Canada geese, you know, around your neighborhood. It's got a nine-digit number on it. That number is unique for all birds banded nationwide. All across the United States, people are looking for these leg bands, and they report them to a, you know, national database, essentially. And then they let us know when our birds are recited, so we know that they're living. We can keep track of how many young they're producing as well. Band locks on their legs, so they can't take it off. And this way, we can really keep a close eye on the population. We know what survivorship's going to look like for individuals. If we have all of our banded birds that just aren't being recited, we know that they probably aren't making it. The other one is a color band that differentiates the birds when we look at them in a spotting scope. It's got a number and a letter on it and different colors. So that allows us to just see the bird or take a picture of the bird and tell that it's different from another bird. These birds will move around. I mean, they won't necessarily stay in Kentucky. In fact, we've had birds go throughout the Midwest. It's interesting to find out if a bird shows up somewhere else and they can read the band number, we find out, oh, that's one of ours that came from Kentucky. We also test them for a disease that's kind of prevalent in Kentucky called trichomonas. They get it from the pigeons that they eat and it causes a really bad inflamed throat. We test them for it because if they have it, we can treat them for it in the nest and like to do everything we can to enhance their survival. Usually it isn't a problem to get their mouth open to do this swab. It's just like a strep throat swab. All right, this bird is done. Since 1999, more than 170 falcons have been banded from the nest boxes managed by KDFWR at our generating stations. So these birds are 25 days old. They hatched from an egg 25 days ago. They'll start flying about two weeks from now. So these brown feathers that are growing out from under the downy plumage are, are gonna be what they look like when they're ready to fly. Boy, that one's considerably less yeah. <laughs> chill than the last one. <laughs> When I started with Peregrine Falcon Restoration, there were no nesting pairs. There was also no digital cameras and no internet. So what we had to do was largely by watching through binoculars or spotting scopes and trying to learn what we can. Now the technology is much better, but the Mill Creek Falcon Cam has brought falcon biology is something that anybody can watch. I mean, they can watch when the first eggs are laid, try to figure out when the first eggs are hatched, get to see the growth of the chicks, get to see what mom and dad are bringing in to feed the chicks. It is so fun. Even if you're not a bird watcher, this is something that's super entertaining. And it's helped us get some really valuable information on, on when nest timing happens in Kentucky and what they're being fed. Our employees are so dedicated to providing a safe space for the peregrine falcons at our generating stations where we have nest box installed. I and mean, they really just enjoy being a part of this experience at our generating stations. All right, so he's gonna lose all his white downy feathers over the next couple of weeks and he'll be flying. He'll be brown instead of gray and like his parents are, and then he'll gradually turn gray over his first year. It's not uncommon to have eggs that don't hatch. We'll have several each year throughout the state. What we do is we collect them and then we freeze them. We'll either send them to the Field Museum in Chicago or the Cincinnati uh, Natural History Museum and they add those to their reference collections so that researchers can go look at those as references, you know, whatever project they're working on. We're very grateful to receive funding each year from LG&E and, &E and KU that goes directly to our Peregrine Falcon activities, helps buy us equipment, and helps pay for our technicians' time to do this work. We launched the Falcon webcam um, with KDFWR in 2013, and what really started as a unique project has grown into an award-winning initiative. Oh, they just opened the box. Oh, they, they did. just opened. Yep. Oh, and look <laughs> at them. <laughs> All is well. All is well. <laughs> With environmental stewardship and empowering education being such a key focus for us, we really saw over time this, this was such an incredible opportunity because we've heard over the years, for instance, that teachers are tuning in to the webcam during the nesting season in their classrooms. You know, as part of our environmental stewardship to help protect the peregrine falcons by providing a safe area for them to nest. It also allows viewers to tune in in near real time and watch the season unfold. It's been an overwhelming success. You know, I, when I started, 
We had zero peregrines nesting in Kentucky, and now, wow, <laughs> there's more than we had historically. So it's been an overwhelming conservation success story. <laughs>